Good morning and welcome to the 50th pre de West Invitational Art Exhibition and Sale. Here to begin today's program is the Curator of Ethnology for the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, Dr. Eric Singleton. Uh, good morning and thank you for joining us for the 50th pre de West. This world-class art exhibition provides the opportunity to bring people together who appreciate the American West through art. Today's seminars will feature several artists eager to share their knowledge, experiences, techniques, and trends in Western fine art. Because of the significance of the content contained in these seminars, we are pleased to once again extend the offering of these seminars to the public, reaching an even larger audience. This tradition continues because of the generosity of our sponsors recognized on the screen. If you see anyone wearing a sponsor ribbon this weekend, please let them know how much we appreciate their support and contributions. We appreciate Panera Bread for providing this morning's refreshments. We also thank seminar sponsor Wendy and Steve Olshan. Many people enjoy, yes. Many people enjoy taking home a memento for Prita West. Our commemorative pre de West bolos, catalogs, and scarves are available for purchase in the museum store located near the front entry. While you're there, please take a few minutes to explore the museum store's trunk shows located right inside the museum store entrance. Although the museum will close at 4 p.m. today, the museum store will remain open until 7. Tonight, beginning at 6 o'clock, society members, sponsors, and ticket holders are invited to attend the cocktail reception in the galleries. Guests will have the opportunity to mingle with the artists while viewing the exhibition. Tomorrow at noon, we'll announce the winner of the 2022 Prix de West Purchase Award. And finally, tomorrow evening, the much anticipated art sale will take place with cocktails in the galleries beginning at 5 p.m. Our celebration will continue with the presentation of awards, live auction, and dinner here in the Sam Noble SEC. We indeed have much to look forward to in the next few days. The first of today's seminars entitled Rarefied Atmospheres. We are fortunate to hear from pre West artists Lynn Shamil, Steve Kestrel, and Randall Dutra. Here to begin our introductions, please welcome pre West artist Andy Peters. Good morning, pre to west patrons, fellow artists, distinguished guests, on this golden anniversary of the most prestigious exhibition in the world. <laughs> in a few moments, it will be my honor to introduce pre to west artist and moderator of today's panel discussion, Randall Dutra. Randy is a friend of mine and I look forward to seeing him here every year to see his newest masterful paintings and sharing his insightful conversations. We also share an admiration for the late Swedish master Bruno Lillefors. Randy is his heir apparent to the genre of predator-prey nature scenes executed with painterly confidence accuracy and imagination. His impressive, his impressive resume includes work with Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, which was groundbreaking in the film industry, and study with Clarence Tolenius and Robert Lockheed, a founding member of the National Academy. Re oh, excuse me. I have got to double check my phone to make sure it's silenced and would you please do the same very quickly so that there we are randy has an outgoing genial nature which has won him a great number of friends including his onstage guests today he will lead them in deep into erudite discussion on their lives and art that one's supposed to be funny. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, 
Will you please join me in welcoming Preta West artist and panel moderator, Randall Dutra. Good morning. You've had your coffee and tea and perhaps a croissant and are settling in. 50 years, 50 years of Nawa and Preta West. That is a milestone. And think of the number of people involved in the history, their contributions of making that happen. We are so fortunate to be in this show. To be with people we care about <clears throat> and love on many levels. Friends, patrons, lovers of the arts, we're all here for that wonderful, wonderful celebration of art. There's, uh, I'd like to give also too, before I close on that, a shout out to Miss Natalie Shirley, Miss Susan Patterson, Mr. Dan Karazi, and the many others that have helped make this show a reality and what it is. <laughs> now there's, uh, there's two gentlemen here, there, uh, who aren't quite spring chickens, but they also haven't seen the last bend in the river and won't for many years. They're at that uh, sweet spot, th those September years where experience meets taste. Of course, I'm talking about Lynn Schmiel and Steve Kestrel. <laughs> Those names strike unease in the braggarts and posers of the fine art world. Why is that? It's because they walk the talk. It's because there's no degree of separation between who they are and the work they produce. It may be something they've seen, certainly something they've experienced. It might be some low simmering concept that finds its time and bubbles to the surface. It starts here, goes here, 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 and straight out to you, baby, mainlining like a crystalline bullet whose aim is true, unadulterated. What they have in common also is longevity of career. And I believe that's due to three ingredients. And like any good recipe, if any one of those ingredients is missing, that souffle can drop. The first is authenticity and integrity. The second is artistic talent and discipline. Yes, discipline. And having a large body of work that is of the highest quality and consistency. And the third is variety. Variety of subject matter. Variety breeds versatility. And these gentlemen have that in abundance. It's, uh, <laughs> it's no secret that Steve and Lenny march to the beat of a different drum. They are effectively deaf to the machinations and whinings of the art market. They are immune to its changing winds and its fickle fashions because what they do is of their time and of their experience, and it's authentic. Just as the artists of 80, 90, 100 years ago, Tau School, Blumenschein, Hennings, uh, the Southern Pacific Railroad posters that have the beautiful uh, guest artists with their wonderful graphic designs, uh, Herbert Dunton, 
a wonderful Western painter who had many uh, modernist uh, additions to his paintings. And then, of course, Maynard Dixon, who's undergone quite a renaissance and rediscovery in these recent years. His unique vision of the West and his incredible depictions of the desert uh, continue, these, these pioneering artists, their work continues to influence art of today. The art we dub uh, new Western art, contemporary Western art, modern Western art rests heavily on the shoulders of these pioneering artists who painted and depicted in such a beautiful artistic vocabulary um, that is unique visions. And I believe, and you can see these, I'm sorry, you can see these ripples happening in all the art today in Western art. I mean, you can see it in the galleries here, wherever you go, you can see that these men and their visions and their authenticity is what allowed these ripples to keep going through new generations and influencing new artists. And it's my belief that Lenny and Steve are just like those originating artists and that their work that you're looking at today is going to continue to influence artists of tomorrow. So without further ado, uh, let's take the deep dive that went into rarefied atmospheres, my friends. Um, and I think you're in for an interesting and rare uh, exchange. Interesting because what they have to say is both meaningful and thoughtful. Rare because <laughs> after today, we may never see them on stage again. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming to this stage Len Schmiel and Steve Castro. First thing I've got to say is thank you to Lenny and Steve for being up here and talking about things that mean something to them. It's not always easy for artists to do this. We're, we're, we're gregarious when we want to be, and other times we can be very private. So thank you again, guys, for coming. I really You're appreciate welcome. it. Yeah. A subject that's been touched on here, uh, this isn't the first time, but influences and mentors. And I know, Len, uh, one of your mentors was uh, Put Putnam. So uh, uh, I was wondering if you had any particular memories of, of Putt and what you might have gotten from him specifically as a mentor. Well, his philosophy uh, was really positive, for one thing. He, uh, he said, just do what you do and do it really well, it, you know, is... You know, and you have to work at it, which he did, and I got that from him. I was working in an aerospace going to night school at Art Center and taking his classes. I took others too, but uh, um, that, that, that was it. He, and I really learned how to draw from him, I think. Um, and he uh, had a, a tremendous amount of knowledge of what or, or how to paint and he got it from his uh his mentor stanley reckless so um yeah that uh, when i was trying to decide whether or not to uh, stay in aerospace and was thinking about going into commercial art he said just do it he said you know what about a an illustrator or designer that was thinking about going into aerospace, they'd be having the same feelings. So, so I did. And I did the same thing when I decided to quit commercial art and uh, just start painting in 1971. So that's when I did it. So. And you know, I had some conversations about influences. And uh, one artist that you, it was really interesting to find this out, is that Remington 
that you really enjoy Remington's work and that we had discussions that what if he had lived longer because he died young? He was how old? 48. Four, 48 when he died and he was going in all these amazing directions in his paintings and we had talked about some of that and how you've noticed certain things or how it influenced. Yeah, I, I mean, he was, he was a fabulous designer uh, and just conceptually, I, I really admire what he did. Plus he was technically just an amazing uh, technician, I, I mean, he, he, he's just one of the best all time as far as I'm concerned. So, and just draftsman, think, painter, designer, conceptualizer, just everything. So. And to think of where he would have gone is, is just really amazing. Yeah, yeah. Steve, um, there's two... Just keep talking to him. Yeah. <laughs> 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 You're going to do fine. Steve, um, I know one of the we have two influences. Uh, one we have in common is Jose de Kraft. Right. Um, but Boris um, Gilbertson was one of your first, and you met him in Santa Fe through George Carlson. Mm -hmm. 1980. And what was it like meeting him? And he had a workshop there. And do you, have, do you even have some of his tools, right? Correct. Yeah. 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 So we met him in 1980, and. Uh, he was on oxygen at that time, portable oxygen, but still working, and uh, he was still doing work. I went back to his shop when we first got there, and he was working, and um, then he died in 1982, and I ended up uh, working in his studio for a couple of years with a lot of his tools. And uh, I still use two air hammers that were from that his significant other, Charlotte White, had purchased for him in 1930, late 30s anyway, because he used them to carve the uh, moose and bison reliefs in the Department of Interior that were installed in 1939, and they're still there, and they're quite beautiful, still. And, and Jose de Creft was quite influential, too. And, and what, what is it? He, was, he was what? Jose de Creft was influential, too, oh, also. Right. And, um, a, a lot of it was, was carving, direct carving, that you enjoyed about his work. What is right. it kind of specifically and, 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 and lightly about his work that, that appeals to you? Mm. Well, he had a wide range of uh, techniques and uh, subject matter. Um, and we actually own a, an original stone carving, a small female head. It's pretty classic. But the first piece I saw of his in person was at the Wichita Art Museum. It's called Maya, and it's a large black stone carving. Mm, yeah. And it's just a masterpiece, a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. I didn't know that this was a, a, a favorite of Steve's because I had Jose de Kreft as, as an a instructor when I went to art school in New York City. Jose de Kreft was 93 years old. Yeah. when I was studying under him. And, uh, and Steve had heard that I'd studied under him, and we've had some great conversations about the man. He was just an incredible uh, inspiration. And uh, you start finding, when you're talking to the artists at the peak of their form, that they have many other interests. And Lenny, one of your interests is gardening. And <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and a lot of it's, you know, connect, connection to art. He's a yeah. master gardener. <laughs> Um, Print yeah. that take. That's the real Chamil laughing. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, yeah, it, I, uh, especially for landscape, um, you, 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 it, it really matters to know your subject. And as a landscape painter, I think gardening and, you know, I have a vineyard with 1,400 grapevines. And... Um, <laughs> an orchard, and a, quite a large garden. I, I enjoy it, but it also connects me to my landscape work. I mm -hmm. mean, if you don't know the intricacies of how a plant grows, how do you really expect yourself to, you know, bring some authenticity to what you're painting? Uh, and it's the same with the geology. Uh, it, it, there should be a study uh, somewhere of, of exploring, you know, how the earth got formed and, you know, what you're looking at when you look at the landscape. Um, so this, I think, you know, it's uh, Andrew Wyeth once said, if you don't 
uh, if you really want to know <laughs> what that rock looks like, go around to the other side if you're going to paint it. And uh, that really matters, uh, the dimensions of it. And yeah, yeah, so. Well, and, and Steve, of course, being a sculptor and a carver, has an incredible array of, of tools and heavy equipment. I remember, you know, us painters, you know, we, again, we have a little stick with hair on the end very daintily or doing these little, you know, touches of color that mean the world to us. And, uh, and, and we was talking with Steve, and one time he said, yeah, I'm going to get this, you know, I'm talking to this macho guy, I'm this little painter, and he, I'm going to get this, uh, this, uh, this, this machine, and it's... Uh, 3,200 pounds. And I go, 3,200 pounds? And he goes, no, Randy. I said 32,000 pounds. It was an earth mover when you were talking about that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just the things that, that Steve deals with and what he's doing is, is amazing <laughs> engineering-wise, too, and the tools he uses. And he knows the other side of the rock. And, and, and the other <laughs> side of the rock, too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so. <laughs> so I was wondering, um, what... Um, it's kind of a general question, but it's specific to who you guys are. You know, what speaks to you when you're in nature? I know, Lenny, um, you're looking at the abstraction of nature, and you're looking at how different colors and things come together. A an example of, of, of Lenny, I was, I was talking with Matt Smith about this, and I may not have this exactly right, but people are setting up to do plein air painting in their, I at the Grand Canyon. Beautiful vistas, all these wonderful things. And here's Lenny. And he's, he's looking, you know, just hasn't really gone very far. He sets up his easel and he goes, and he looks, and it's a barrel cactus. And he does a whole painting of a barrel cactus. The universe is in that barrel cactus, not out there. And that speaks to character and observation. So, Lenny, speak to those intimate paintings you do with, that are so wonderful, because you do both, but... Well, it's... it's, it's what, first of all, I'm looking for a composition. What speaks to me of where I am. And speaking of Matt, I was out with Matt and Ralph and uh, Oberg and some other guys a couple years ago, and what spoke to me was a couple rocks. And Matt gave it a title because what I was doing was painting a shadow of a rock on a rock. And that's all it is, is a composition. <laughs> I mean, it just, and, but it, that's what I just found interesting at the time. Um, yeah, there we had, we were in a canyon with great saguaro cactus and bluffs and sky and, and uh, just all sorts of subject matter, but this, I don't know, I just do what happens up here, so. And Steve, you scary you, enough. So you hike quite a bit in your where you live, and so it, I would say, like, for, for speaking for myself, is like if I have a talent, it's recognizing what nature is showing me. It's like, wow, that's cool, or that's cool, where somebody else could walk by it. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of I think being an artist is it's going to sound corny, but it's like listening to nature and and seeing something that if you only worked in the studio, you would never would have thought of in a million years. And, and Steve, is that kind of true with you getting out and looking at? Well, it's, yeah, it's definitely part of the mix. Yeah. And uh, almost in any given day, uh, in, in our canyon anyway, there are things that are awe-inspiring. And uh, the trick, I guess, is to use some of that uh, energy to make it get into your art. And we've had some conversations that it was interesting is that I was, what's the, um, the beginning of the physical process of like when you're carving is how completely do you see it in your mind? Do you mm. see it rotating or no? Is it, is it, do you see like maybe 30% of it and as you're working it comes to fruition? Or do you have a pretty good idea because you're doing subtractive, which we'll get into subtractive work, which is fairly permanent, making decisions. It depends. It, it, uh, sometimes I have the idea fairly fully, uh, fully formed, and then at other times, like the ram's head that's in this show, I, I had a fairly good idea of how it was going to go, 
but the, the, the stone, it was, you know, natural river stone was so oddly shaped that I wasn't quite sure what I could get out of it. And I try to maximize whatever I'm carving on the, the boundaries, the outer extremities of that, those stones, keep it as large as I can get it. But then every now and then I have to shrink it up because of flaws in the stone or, or it's not going to balance out with, with uh, one side or the other in, in terms of, of symmetry. So you have to adjust all that. And what's interesting, I, I was thinking about this, is what Steve does is when he carves, painters, we have basically a canvas, and it's the same canvas that will go to a blank canvas. Steve's raw material is changing all the time. Hmm. So he, he, he'll, he'll have a, a certain kind of rock or stone in one sense, and then he'll see something else in another rock or stone that's completely different in hardness or in, in faults <coughs> or in... in porosities or in all mm -hmm. of this stuff. So I was thinking, is that one thing that, that helps keep your work so vital and different and not repeating yourself? Because the raw material yeah. you're working with changes all the time. Right, right. And it fits my attention span, which is pretty short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so I, once I get a stone like that, I can lock in on it and do something. I want to add that he has a collection of rocks. And, you know, how long... They may be sitting around mm -hmm. just because you have a sense of what was going, that there was something there for you to explore, it may take years. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've had and stones when around the concept for a finally arrives, yeah. you know, and this brings up a subject that we've talked about. One of my um, favorite artists, a guy named Richard Diebenkorn, said, attempt the unknown when beginning a painting. And you do that, I do that, I don't know what's gonna, you know, how they're going to turn out. Mm -hmm. I have a concept of it and you know, what I want out of it, but what you get out of it may be not what you started with. But, right. but you always have to have the concept so that you can go back to that and draw, you know, when you start going sideways, yeah. or when I start going sideways uh, on something, when it's not working, you're going, why did I start this? Uh, you go back to the concept when you have one and, and examine why it's not going the way you thought it, it could go. So. Mm -hmm. And another thing I, I was thinking of you too, in, in contrasting, is that, you know, when we're painting, I'm speaking generally now, there's, there's different things, but you're, you're capturing <laughs> fleeting um, actions or motions and light that's changing. And so there's spontaneous applications of paint that mimics what you're seeing, that energy at that time. And then I think of Steve and how thoughtful and deliberate his approach has to be because it's, it's, it's permanent. It's, it's like he's making these decisions that he can't go back on. And it's a slower approach and it's an unforgiving approach. So it's very interesting to think of those two in contrast to one another. Um, and experiencing textures in, in paint. We can experience textures in a certain way. And, and Steve and Stone, different stones have completely different textures. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, I just thought that was kind of interesting in, in, in that difference of, of artistic approach. When I was talking with him this morning, I said, so I was talking about the ram and that he has in the show <laughs> and, and how how tenuous some of the stone is. You know, carving something that's in stone that's out there in free air, all he takes is one mistake to break that off. And I asked him, you know, what happens then? He says, you just make it smaller. <laughs> Feel free to break it any time, Steve. Okay. You know, fortunately, it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> and Not with an expert. <laughs> yeah. And also, Steve, I was, I was thinking, um, as you're looking at stones and contemplating, um, there's stones that are of a form, and then there may be fragments of stones that may be more jagged or different that may suggest something else. So is that something that you'll, you know, uh, uh, th that Cindy will catch you just sitting down and just like looking at stones and not saying anything, but just looking, yes, just looking at stones and, and how fragments may suggest something different than, a, than an entire stone? 
that can happen, but um, since I carve a lot of river stones, um, and, and as it turns out, I can get a fair amount of, of uh, my material out of Redstone Creek. We have a, about a half a mile of Redstone Creek. And uh, when we bought the property in 1994, I didn't realize how much granite and schist uh, was, was in that because the, the canyon is all red sandstone right where, in our area. But the overburden from millions of years ago has come down and then it's also washed downstream uh, over millions of years. So, And, and then we had this discussion, um, of course, uh, as you look at a stone, is it something you envision something and you're imposing you know, your will on that stone even though it's suggesting something? And other times you're looking at the stone and it suggests something. And it works both ways. It works uh, both ways. And we were kind of talking about, you know, percentages, and it was like 25% would be that it suggested, and the other was that, that you knew where you were going with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somewhere in that neighborhood. But I mean, yeah, <laughs> not that it's a numbers thing, but it just shows that there's, a, you know, the yeah. bias. That looks well, like the bobcat in there, um, I wanted to do it fairly close to life size, and, and I, I, I wanted to do it in black granite, and I'd gone to... Uh, the old quarry up in in Wyoming, north of our place, about 80 to 100 miles. And the stone I thought I could use ended up being too small after I brought it in and drew on it. And so I had one more out there that was quite a bit bigger than what I needed, but it's my only option. So I ended up using that, and I probably carved easily as much stone, probably 200 and... 50 pounds off of that block to get the bobcat. <laughs> and uh, that piece weighs 232 pounds now. So. Wow. And that was uh, a bobcat that Cindy found, is that right? Well, I used the reference material. Yeah, Cindy had found a bobcat that had just been hit uh, around the reservoir going up to our place, and she couldn't bear to leave it in the, in the road and brought it home, and I got the camera out and, and did a lot of reference uh, photos that I used on that. And, and Lenny, um, you're known for many things, but your colors are, and your color harmonies are, are just wonderful. Um, any, any thoughts on, on, on colors and, and, and values? Because a lot of times you're painting color temperature, which is in some ways is different than painting straight color values. and mm -hmm. so. What kind of things go through your head when you're thinking of, of harmonies, or is it just what the subject is dictating you from the get-go? I think it's both. Uh, you know, I'm certainly influenced by what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm a subjective painter, um, so those those harmonies may or may not exist. Uh, and, and emphasis, emphasizing one element or another is just what goes through my head. If it it has to belong in the painting, mm -hmm. uh, and so I guess that's my answer. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's intuitive too, yeah. and you know, it's another thing I learned from Putt. You know, is to really take a look at those things and either create a vibration of color or minimize it. You know, these are all compositional tools, and certainly color temperature is one of them. I know what what you want to do with the surface uh, uh, that you see. You know, so, Steve, how do you feel um, looking back over your work? How do you feel your work has changed or evolved as you've gotten older? Hmm. Well, a lot of it's in, in a sense the same. Um, Maybe more simplification, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a little more difficult to to carve now. Hands and arms are suffering mm -hmm. from years of from heavy yeah, machinery. Yeah, some neuropathy in this in this hand in particular. And My little finger is starting to bug me from painting. <laughs> <So I can laughs> <laughs> Lenny, what about you in relation to? Uh, 
evolving? I mean, I, I, I mean, it's probably we're probably the worst people to ask because we're in the middle of it. But do you have a sense of maybe where you'd like to go, or some things you'd like to try that you haven't, or evolving in a more abstract? Or you know, I uh, I started <laughs> off just doing I, when I became uh, or when, when I transitioned from being a commercial artist to a to uh, an easel painter. I just decided that I would paint whatever interested me instead of picking on one subject as I, th my, <laughs> my uh, fellow uh, artists or, or presentation artists where I was working uh, would say, yeah, if you're going to paint, you know, you have to figure out where your genre is and just stay in that and, you know, and, and really uh, make a career out of it. And I said, well, if I'm going to if that's the way to do it, then my career is going to be of painting anything and everything that I want to because it interests me. Amen. And mm -hmm. I can I do that to this day. Take a look. <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> okay. That's Jacob, can we have that first slide? This will be your uh, painting. I don't know what it. Oh, you can't see I, it from I here. I can't see. It's, it's art imitates life. Painting, <laughs> yours. Oh yeah, that one. <laughs> and, and I think this is a masterpiece. Look at the composition. Look at the concept of this. It's brilliant. I, I love it. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, there you go. Okay. Yeah, that one took me um, a while. It was like I had the idea, and it was like one of Steve's. Uh, stones that, you know, he just had a sense of what he would someday do with it. Um, it took me five or six years to come up with this idea. Um, I had the idea, it was where I used to deer hunt it in, in, um, in the sandstone country down in uh, southern Utah, and there's these uh, layers of sedimentary uh, rock there in the canyon of the Virgin River, and I don't know, I just thought about it, and I don't know, it just came together gradually over a period of, of those years, and I did, I don't know, probably 40 or 50 idea sketches of it, and finally uh, decided, oh, I can just make this great big goofy um, uh, semblance of a uh, pictograph uh, and with the sh as the shadow of one of the mule deer that I was hunting and because I found evidence all kinds of potsherds and and chips and because I, I learned how to chip arrowheads and so forth from a from a fellow in California when I lived there and uh, so I'd find this stuff just about everywhere we go Jim Morgan and I go out there and start looking at the ground instead of looking for something to paint and uh, <laughs> So that's the way this thing conceptualized, and it was, it was pretty funny. That's the first painting I had uh, in the uh, Autry show, and uh, Bill Kerr got it for the Wildlife Museum. Museum. So yeah. That's where I first saw it. Yeah. And I saw it from across the room, and man, that design, bang. It was, and I go, yeah, what is funny. that? And then I got up closer. And yeah, it was, uh, see it. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> there was an art dealer who told another art dealer at the show, and the, the second guy said, he said, does he really think he's going to convince people that that's the shadow of that deer? <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, art dealers, but, you know, yeah. no, I didn't. <laughs> so bad. So. Can we have the second slide, please? And Steve, this is your uh, recipe. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Is there a question? It's not mine. <laughs> no. <laughs> so. if, you, if you look at the, obviously, the left side shows process. So if you can go oh. a little, if you can grace us with a little oh, bit well of process, that's <laughs> that'd be great. How you start and, and how you're using the, the, the crayon to draw on the stone. And right. Yeah. Well, initially, I was using chalk so I could erase the, the lines easier because there were a lot of lines. And trying to figure out how to fit that into that block. And... The limiting factor in terms of its size was going to be from the bottom of the feet to the top of the ears, so with that, that particular pose. And uh, I think in the catalog I've mentioned that uh, 
I was really inspired by Edward Sandoz, French sculptor. You, you yeah. know quite well. Yeah, he's great. And I'm sure many of the sculptors here know. Uh, so that, he had done a, uh, a pose of a domestic cat in that position, and it just uh, really, really got me. I thought it was so uh, contemplative, and, and, and I think, uh, yeah, in the catalog, I've talked about the hours and hours we've watched bobcats, especially in the snow, catching voles and mice, and then once they have a few, they settle down and, and sit like that, and maybe wash their face a little bit, but we've watched them for uh, set like that for maybe 10 or 15 minutes at a time. What I love about these process shots, it's almost like watching an embryo come to form. You can follow it, and you can, and you can as much as possible, follow kind of Steve's thought process as he's turning the form, as he's marking the the, the stone, as he's keeping his outlines, as he's keeping this a 360 degree drawing. It's just, those pictures are amazing. I love seeing process pictures. Yeah, and these are leftovers from that quarry where I, I, I uh, bought a, a number of tons of black granite up in Wyoming. And uh, as I said earlier, I normally carve river stones, but I didn't have anything that was going to be big enough in terms of river stone and, and that solid black color, which is what I had wanted for this piece. A lot of the other granites that I have in terms of river stones are more speckled and gray. Right. I didn't have anything that was real dark like this. You can fade the slide. Thank you, Jacob. I think it's interesting, oh. you know, the point about observation, and that's what we're all about as artists, is observing. And for Steve to observe, as he was just saying, that's the nuance of the color temperature and so forth for me. <clears throat> and it's what we take out of the process. You know, what he, Steve sees and decides is important to include is what makes it unique and different from any other animal sculpture there is. Yeah. And he's from another planet, so he sees different yeah. things. He's the alien. Steve so. is the alien, as, as so. we've called it before. Uh, I'm going to do a little inside baseball here. And... Artists are, are, are very aware that, that, that the general public gravitates towards subject matter. And it's not good or bad, it's just human nature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, artists, at least the artists I know, will gravitate towards how something is done, regardless of subject matter. And so that's something I've always enjoyed about your gentleman's work, is it's, it's a, it, it may be a different subject matter than I've seen you do, but the way in which it's done, the way in which the paint is layered, or the way in which you've done certain textures, Steve, that just like, why did he do that there? And then you start looking at the concept of the piece, and you go, oh, okay, it's kind of make, I'm kind of getting into the alien mode, but I'm, I'm kind of seeing where this is going. But it's fascinating to see how artists, regardless, again, of subject matter, how artists, are, if there's collectors or, or, or art appreciators out there, Next time you see a painting of a subject that, you know, I don't, it doesn't really appeal to me, if, but go look at how it's done. You may like just looking at the surface and seeing it as, as a beautiful abstract and, and collections and layers of, of colors. Um, it's a great exercise for artists, too, because artists can become biased. Um, Lenny, you, you were talking about um, uh, working outdoors and... I uh, have this quote, my process changes with the subject, abstracting the communication with the landscape. Yeah, uh, I, when I work outdoors, I, <laughs> as my friends know, I may be the last one to start and certainly the last one to finish because I wander around until I can identify with some part of it that speaks of that place. You know, and it's my impression of that place. It's not going... I rarely will jump out of the car if we're driving or, and just stop and start painting a subject. I have to wander around and, uh, and identify with it. And it, it's, 
is just my, part of my process. And, and it may take a while, it may take 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, it might take all day and never anything happens. <laughs> so, but I've done a lot of looking, so it's rehearsal. Lenny had a, uh, an interesting quote in our conversations. He said, uh, and I quote, you can fill it in if okay. I'm not. He said, I'm not a telescope. I'm a shiny orb reflecting in all directions. <laughs> I said that? You said that. Okay. And it's great. It's pretty good. I'm not a toadstool. I'm a shiny <laughs> <laughs> You're a shiny orb. I thought you were talking about my pate, but I guess not. Yeah. Um, well, I just, you know, you want to see everything. You know, take it all in. And that's the, ob everybody observes. And, but we're, I think that's probably what artists are more about, is we see every or try to see everything. So. And we can talk to our wives, and they say, you don't observe anything. Yeah. And yet, as artists, you know, we're finely tuned, but I guess it's, it's very uh, targeted. Um, and then and you also were mentioning composition supports concept and the motion that supports a concept. Where are you going with the motion that supports a concept? Well, that's how I feel about it. Uh, Not emotion, motion. Oh, motion. Motion that that's supports what a concept. Again, yeah. So. <laughs> well, you were talking about textures of brushwork and, and so forth. Uh, and there's motion in that brushwork. And there's also, you were talking about the relativity of time in relation to... Oh, okay. oh the time passing. Yeah, uh, when, when we're working outdoors, uh, um, I include that passage of time because it doesn't stop. You only have a, a couple hours to get a painting done. So you have to consider that when you start, how much time you have to get the painting finished. And you have, you know that innately because of your experience of having done, you know, a couple thousand of them outdoors. Or, um, and um, so you, you kind of create, as the, s the sun is moving or, or as the day goes on, you include parts of what you're painting on, and as it progresses, that's going to be changing out there for you. So those changes are included in the painting, or not. I mean, you can leave them out and go back to your concept. Um, but I try to include those changes, you know, whether it's consciously or unconsciously. So I get the sense, when I look at them, that of the passage of time in a motionless, two-dimensional surface. Well, in my case, it's sort of semi-two-dimensional because <laughs> I use a lot of paint. <laughs> um, yeah, so. And Steve, uh, in our conversations, it was interesting for me to hear that <clears throat> when you're brainstorming a piece or a, pre a prelude to a piece, um, you write notes. Mm -hmm. You've written notes more than any drawings or sketches. Mm -hmm. and, and I was wondering yeah. why, why that is, that it takes that form. I mean, it's obviously comfortable for you, but does it give you more of a chance to contemplate or is drawing's not necessary because you'll get into that as you focus what it is you're going for? Well, it's a number of things. Um, the, the concept is what usually, and that concept can include uh, kind of a mental image of how I think I want it to be, but... Uh, then I can take the concept and, and modify it, um, let it evolve in a sense. And if I start drawing on a piece of paper, um, it tends to lock that image down more. And so I don't want to do that in the early stage. So it, it limits you more than words do. Huh. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Huh. What an idea. Um, now, I really want you to impress upon our esteemed audience here direct carbon versus pointing up in clay and, and modeling. Uh, because there's no parachute when you're carving. Uh, your commitment is absolute. Uh, when you're modeling in clay, uh, you, can, you can subtract and you can add. So 
direct carving is like, you know, I mean, Rodin didn't even direct carve. He had <laughs> workers that were doing carvings from his clay pieces. Right. Right. So direct carving is like a, an extreme discipline. Right, and uh, as we were talking earlier about Jose de Kraft, he was one of the direct carvers. That, I think he came here in 1928 from Spain. And, uh, and then John Flanagan, same thing, he was an American uh, direct carver. Uh, what is it about direct carving, though, that, that it is you? That, that it is just, is it's just so direct. And then it and it's uh, it uh, it's an extended meditation almost, right? Right. I mean, it's and it's just because of this. If I get a block of stone, or if I have a block of stone that's been from a quarry and it's a cube or a rectangle, it just it doesn't inspire me at all. And so these river stones and and even field stones. It, depends on the shape and the size and the color, can uh, inspire me in different ways. And sometimes, they, like you said, they just sit around for years and, and I'll have an idea and then I'll go looking at the hundreds of stones I have out behind the studio and see if they're going to fit. And then, uh, and then at other times, I'll, because I love, love looking for stones, I'll, I'll find something and doesn't happen very often, but it tells me exactly what it wants to be or what direction I want to go with it. And it may be something you, you, you had no idea until right. you saw it. Right. Is that in it's a sense? It's very suggestive in terms of what it might be. Exactly. Sometimes, if I'm lucky. I mean, that, there's, there's such a purity to that of respecting nature and having something that's, that nature is presenting to you that then you have the audacity or temerity to break into something that's already so beautifully. Mm -hmm in and of itself, without doing anything. Right. Uh, I have a little story. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> when Nancy and I were on the coast of California a couple of years ago, and um, there, it was a particularly rocky area around Monterey, as I recall, and there was this beautiful stone about this big with, I, I, I'm pretty sure it was granite, but I'm not sure, and I, I remember <laughs> telling you about it. And there were these veins of different colors, uh, basically in the, in the same color range of, of different values, dark and light and so forth. And it really looked like surf. Hmm. And I thought, God, Steve would love this rock. <laughs> you know, it, with, I could just sort of try to imagine what he would have done with it with some sea creature or something. And I told him about it when I came in, and he asked me if I brought it back. <laughs> it probably weighed 150 pounds. <laughs> That's so, nothing. I, yeah, yeah. I go, <laughs> Throw it in your paint not box. Not for right? you, it's nothing. <laughs> you and Nancy could have loaded that easily. <laughs> so, <laughs> Gee. Yeah, it was, it was a gorgeous <laughs> stone. I said, in fact, I think I photographed it. Maybe, I, I, I can't remember if I did or not. But. <laughs> Steve, another thing I, I find fascinating about what, when you're working with organic materials that are changing all the time is <clears throat> I was, was talking with Cindy in the, in the gallery, and there was a piece you did, I believe, of a, of a, of a chicken or a cock or something, and you, you took the flaw of the, of, of, of the stone and made it the comb. Oh, right. Of, <laughs> so, so things like that yeah. where you're thinking on the fly instinctively, something will come to you that's suggested by this native material. Um, and so I, I just um, had some things, you know, the cracks and the, and the flaws that you don't see until you get into it sometimes make you more creative in going into another a direction that you never mm -hmm. would have contemplated mm -hmm. unless you got into that certain level of, of the stone and you were seeing different things. Yeah. And, and a lot of the uh, coloring in, in particular, it, well, it depends on the, the amount of abrasion, but a lot of the river stones have been in there so long, they've absorbed a lot of iron. And so the, the, the exterior is a rust red. And those surfaces are actually quite a bit harder than the interior. And, uh, and sometimes you can use those to advantage. And other times, on a few pieces, I've had um, the distracting because the difference between the outside and the inside is so different. And then I try to maybe 
remove more of the iron oxides in it to, to even out the color. But it just depends. I, I'm sure it's happened sometimes where you've been working on a piece and you just, you get to a point where you're in a box and it's just like, okay, this one. Or, or do you always find a way to go around it? I usually find a way to go around it and I, and I try to do... Uh, as much as I can, basically the first day, because if, and, and this has only happened, you know, a handful of times, you spend a day on a piece and, and you just find that it's not going to work and you have to abandon it. But that's really, really rare over the last be 40 years, yeah. pretty quick. And that there's nothing like feeling you wasted a time on trying to, a bad idea or something that won't let you go past it and you spend time doing that. Yeah. Yeah, looking for major flaws in the stone, may, you know, dry cracks that you, you thought you knew were there, and then you run into something that, you didn't no, this goes deeper, and I can't, I can't bottom out on it. It's going to keep splitting. You can't navigate, navigate it. Yeah, man. but that's rare. Yeah. Gotten to where I can, can uh, usually tell. I, uh, sometimes, if I'm not sure, I'll, I'll spray it, just mist it with water, and then watch the water evaporate. And those cracks will hold the water a little longer. Huh. And when everything else is evaporated, I mean, that, that may be the last 15 seconds of it. Hmm. But if you're observant, you can tell, tell where they are. You don't want to hear that from Steve Castro right there. <laughs> Lenny, oh, I'm sorry. No, one, one of the things that impresses me about, I already did it again, um, Steve's sculpture is the, I have a, pair of morning doves that he did. And, well, I'm not sure they're morning doves, they're doves. Morning doves. Morning yeah. doves, okay. Yeah. And uh, it's the, what his sculptures emote is tenderness for wildlife, for animal life, and respect. Mm. They, they just, they, it, it sort of slowly exudes from the sculpture, the sage grouse with the little chicks. I mean, who's going to do a bunch of little chicks in a sage grouse? <laughs> it's kind of like, but that's the life that Steve observes and, and sculpts and impresses me so much. Uh, it, uh, well, in that sage grouse uh, with the young, I don't know if it's the same piece that Cindy, you and I were talking about, is that the pieces that Steve was taking off of the hen, kind of looked at it and said, you know, those could be chicks. And he made chicks out of the fragments that he was taking off of the mm. hen. So it's pretty cool. But it's taking those chips and putting them in there. Yeah. That is the artist, you know. Mm. They, they would have been just chips for another artist, or, or maybe exactly. not, but, you know, who exactly. knows. But that's the individual. He's still thinking past the, into the True concept. offspring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, Lynn, it, it's, <laughs> yes. it's no secret that you, uh, and a lot of artists, but, but you in particular have a fascination with water mm. and it's all its properties and huge, well, paintings it, 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 in the show this year, it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a complete, you could turn it upside down and it's an absolutely satisfying abstract. So water, you know, mutable, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's, it's life. Well, I spent a lot of time fly fishing and spent a lot of time looking at the water instead of fishing. So um, <laughs> uh, it's fascinating. It, um, it never stops. You know, flowing water. Um, lakes never stop. Um, the, the surface is always in action, even when we look out at a flat, you know, piece of or bit of calm water that's absolutely calm. It's not really because the earth is a dynamic place. You know, it's got this molten core that's vibrating always. So the surface of, of water, microscopically, if you were to look, you know, could be perfectly flat looking, but it's not perfectly flat. And I'm just fascinated by the, the dynamics of it. I was once observing and really looking closely, sitting on a riverbank at and notice that there were little tiny wavelets, little tiny wavelets, moving back upstream against this torrent 
of spring runoff. I mean, what's going on with that? Well, there was a rock there, and these little, little wavelets were, the water's going this way, and these little wavelets were bouncing off of the rock and going back upstream <laughs> over the top of this, you know, this observation again. Yeah. And trying to mimic that, you can't get it with a camera. It's not possible to get that stuff with the camera. You have to be there, look at it, because the camera's going to either focus on the surface or on the bottom or somewhere in between. And if you try to you know, get motion out of it, you, you look at photographs of, of water, mostly there's this white fuzz that happens because in a 125th of a second exposure, it's moved this far and it's turned the focus into fuzz. But with a paintbrush, you can make it as sharp or as fuzzy mm. as you want. And <laughs> so, what you, so it's, it's just one of our tools of actually, you know, observing on the spot and being there to paint what the action is that makes what your con or what my concept of what I want out of that that bit of water. It may be the surface at one point, it may be the, you know, the below the surface, like a painting in the show is a combination of all of those things. So the re seeing through it, seeing the reflection, so, you know, those are fascinating for me. Plus there's fish in there, so. <laughs> to do the work that, that you guys have done, you obviously have to have a wide base of knowledge. It's just, you couldn't do what you do if you didn't have that. Um, Steve, you were like a born tool maker. You like making things with your hands, physical things. What would you have become if you would not have become a carver? Mm. No, I'm not sure. I, I, mm. Do you want me to ask Lenny the same question and come back? <laughs> <laughs> Lenny, w w what about... Time better served. Yeah. Hmm? Go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, gosh, I've thought about that. Uh, I think it probably would have been designing mm -hmm. and probably ultimately it would have been um, something with, with natural, you know, like landscape, designing landscapes or, uh, and I, I I, I think it would have been somewhere along those lines. I, I would not, even though I enjoy and feel really connected to, to growing vegetables and, and fruit and all of that, it, it would have been more on a design scale, I think. Um, there was an English gardener, which he called himself, called Capability Jones in England in, I think it was the 1600s, and he designed landscapes of thousands of acres <laughs> the trees removed and replanted. It. I mean, it was fascinating to read about this guy. Um, and, you know, landscape on that scale, landscape. that's really yeah. designing, you know. And I'm not sure that what there's, there's much better designer than nature itself because yeah. it takes into consideration everything that's happening to it, so. So, Steve, have you never down here? Wait, it would be with equipment, wouldn't it? It would be with machinery or not necessarily? Yeah, I probably would have made, well, I made furniture for a number of years mm -hmm. before made I started what? building houses. Oh, houses, okay, so, yeah, with your hands. And so, then, so construction, uh, And creative. then 1982, I gave up the house thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and went to sculpture full time. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, my other interests were, were always uh, archaeology, anthropology. Mm -hmm. Zoology, so geology, and geology. Maybe. But boy, <laughs> it's tough. Lynn, you gave me um, two quotes um, that, that you found. Uh, one by Diebenkorn is "Accept what is not certain when beginning a painting," and also, "Art should be the visual exploration of an idea, and is more interesting than a visual statement of certainty." Those are both quotes that you gave me that I think really reflect. Wait, they're both what? Is, say that again, I'm sorry. The last one? 
Uh, no, what you just said, because oh, I, I missed part of it. You're those were statements that I hadn't heard from anyone else before that, that, huh. you, that you have mentioned that, we, that you found particularly interesting, because we talked about, you know, one of the, one of the things that gives artists anxiety besides being on stage is, is um, facing a blank canvas or having a, 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 a stone in front of you that you're responsible for making something of this. Um, how, do, how do you think about that, or how do you deal with that initial approach on something, Glenn? Well, have no fear, for one thing. Uh, I had a design class uh, at our center, one of the first classes that you're required to take to, to start. Uh, it, and the instructor was a, was a uh, graphic designer, and he says, you're facing a blank canvas, and if you're intimidated by it, you will never get anything out of it. He says, make a mark, any kind of mark <laughs> on it to get started. Yeah. You know, because if you keep staring at that blank canvas, that's, it is intimidating. I and mean, I'm sure it's the same for Steve. You know, so. Steve, is it, that same, is it that same first mark or is it, you know, that first chisel or is it? Hmm. How, how do you get past the inertia of, or you just dive into it? Uh, I just figured I don't have anything to lose. You know, I found the stone, it's free, <laughs> it's, I didn't pay know, for it. Attempt the, <laughs> attempt the it's uncertain. It's chalk, I can erase it. <laughs> you know, yeah. Pardon? Attempt the uncertain. Yeah, yeah. and then just you have to get started. see what happens. Yeah. Uh, it's I almost an act of aggression, getting over something to, yeah. you know, benevolent yeah. aggression. This silliness that, that this, we, excuse me, that's not, not nice. Uh, <laughs> the idea that we have to be inspired and that people, as artists, depend on being inspired, which is what most folks, I've heard this over and over yeah. again. How do you get inspired <laughs> from people who want to be artists? I mean, I, I'm sure that your list is as long as mine about what we want to do. Yeah. There's, there's no inspiration to it. We, we just we feel it and want to do it and get it done. You know, being intimidated by it, I don't know where that comes mm -hmm. from. I mean, I, I, I guess once you get the experience of actually doing it and I don't want to say forcing the issue, forcing yourself to do it because it's not really force, you know. It's something that we want to do mm -hmm. and we just start, you know. Jacob, can you put up, uh, oh. Put oh. up the next slide. There, oh, there you go. There it is. So there you go, Len. <laughs> Take it away, Lenny. <laughs> well, I wasn't supposed to be in Cuba in 2004, but that's where that is. Um, we um, were staying in a village uh, at the uh, northwest part of Cuba uh, called Vinales, and uh, <coughs> staying in a home with a couple friends of mine who were from the valley that I live in, and one of them was a former travel agent, and, and um, that just impressed me as a scene. Uh, they, the Cuban people itself were, were really friendly, and the, the, the woman whose home we were staying in, and renting the space for him, she was cooking and doing everything, and it, this just sort of exuded that presence for me of, of you know, it, it had a lot of emotional content, a, a place to rest. What the heck's the title? I can't remember. It's a, of a com sense. comfort zone. It, hmm? Comfort zone. Comfort zone, and it just it just inspired me. The the, the garden. There was a garden there, uh, and supposedly with all of the, the, the bad things that go on in Cuba and everything, and I, and I didn't experience that at, in this peaceful village. And um, the night before, uh, it, it, I mean, there, there is certainly, there was and still is, I'm sure, oppression there, but uh, she had asked us if we would go into the backyard and just sit there for about an hour. And it was a completely black evening. There was no moon at all. It was, and because she explained that the government uh, um, agents were coming along the street 
to see how many people were staying, you know, tourists were staying in the homes because they were only allowed two in her home and there were three of us. So we were just sitting out there completely just in total darkness. I mean, we couldn't see anything. And um, for about 45 minutes, I said. And then the next morning I got up and, and there it was. And it's mm. just beautiful. It was, yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, I, this is a, a large piece of, of that, uh, that painting. And uh, it's, I don't know, about like that. And, so it just brings me back. You know. I save a lot of my small paintings just for emotional reconnection of something similar when I'm working on a larger piece. So. Jacob, can we have a second slide? Okay, Steve, there's, there's pr process on the left. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's a strange stone. Uh, a fellow from California s sent me, I don't know, six, seven hundred pounds of stone three or four years ago. And this was one of them off of his uh, ranch in the Central Coast. And I told him I had wanted to carve red stone and really, really tough to find good solid red, red uh, piece of stone all the way through. And I'm just not quite sure what it is. I don't know if it's jasper or feldspar. Um, it's got a lot of iron in it, mm. and it, it's, it, it's extremely hard and brittle, and it's got a little bit of quartzite going through it also. And the, one of the reasons I wanted this up there um, is in terms of the base. I had had it photographed. I thought I had finished it, and fortunately I had not permanently pinned the, the head on the base. And... Uh, I got it back to the studio, and over the next day or two, it just was driving me nuts. I thought I'd overbased it, and it was way too heavy. You can see in the in the photographs there, the, the one on the left, the bevel is uh, not as steep, and it just kept bugging me. And I called Susan. I said I'm going to have it rephotographed, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, spent the day trimming that that base down and then attaching the head permanently and had it had a rephotograph. But I guess the point of the whole thing, even at the last minute, if something like that, and the sculptors here know that, uh, but just for the general public, you gotta take care of it. You you can't let it slide. It'll even bug something you forever is forever if you don't. And even if no one else notices, you will notice. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, is this an example of some we're getting, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is this an example of something that um, that you had an idea of doing a ram's head, and then you found the rock, or did the rock suggest? Well, uh, I, I had seen a little or a picture of a small uh, Baltic amber carving that was, gosh, what was it, three or four thousand years old, of this little ram's head, and uh, I'd seen pictures of, of quite a few, and they're uh, not the typical yellow; they were more red at, because of the area they came from, and uh, it just inspired me. I thought that, that little ram's head was just incredible and beautiful, and wanted to do it, but I wanted to do it out of redstone, so I'd been wanting to do that for three or four years, and then that fellow sent me that, that stone. So bubble to the top. Yeah, and I had a general idea about the base, and, and uh, the other thing that I did is I, st initially when I was playing that base, I'd stacked everything up and had the ram set on there and it still wasn't quite right. And that's when I decided to uh, introduce that little sliver of sandstone between the very bottom part of the base and the upper part to just accent. It's, it's like, I, I suppose, uh, when you're framing mm -hmm. your paintings, same, same idea. Lindy, you had some things well, that yeah, we found Well, yeah, uh, this reminded me of a statement that I brought along that I wanted to read. This is uh, by a, a uh, writer for The New Yorker, and be, it, it, I don't know what he was doing in The New, York, New Yorker. He's writing about this winemaker, and I make wine because I have the vineyard, you know. And it struck me because uh, this guy, as a writer, really nailed what uh, we go through, and not 
not just artists, I mean, but it felt particularly apropos to, to me as an artist. Um, he's talking about this uh, winemaker that I know of who has now uh, sold his winemaking stuff. Anybody here Big House Red and so forth? Probably not, but it, he came up with these really whimsical names for the wines he was producing, and he's a really brilliant winemaker. I mean, he, everybody in the industry uh, respects this fellow. Uh, his name is Randall Graham. And so the writer, this is an excerpt from it, and I kind of paraphrase it a little for a little more clarity. It says, Drive, and he, they were driving around uh, Santa Cruz, California in the mountains of where this fellow had started when he became, when he wanted to become a winemaker, and he started by planting a vineyard uh, that didn't pan out, didn't work out. And uh, so he says, uh, driving slowly around the old vineyard, another dream plot in the Santa Cruz mountains, Graham seemed unusually quiet, which is really unusual for this guy. <laughs> he says, uh, for many imaginative people, artists or winemakers, life always feels like a failure seen from inside. Where the rest of us see only the accomplishments, they see the unrealized scale of the ambitions that preceded the accomplishments. And um, I, do we ever really get it solved? Mm -hmm. I never do. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there's, there's always something to learn and something that we didn't get out of our dream for that canvas or that stone mm -hmm. or whatever it is, or that dance, whatever uh, creative accomplishment, and, and, a, and a bottle mm -hmm. of wine for that matter. You know, <laughs> it could always be better and that's the pursuit. Um, if you just stay open to it and want to keep learning and realize you'll never know it. Uh, so that's what keeps us driving and keeping, keeps us going. So, was there, yeah, curiosity. Was there anything else that hmm? you want? Was there any other quotes you had that you wanted to, to read? Uh, no, you, that, you that, know, that I tried to simplify it because I get wordy. <laughs> so, well, I, I, I don't think this would be complete without bringing up ladies in our lives and how important yes. they are. Yeah. So I know Nancy is, yeah, and Cindy well, and um, so. And Steve, Mo. Yeah, well, I, I'm getting and, there. Yeah. You're the guest. So yeah. what, what uh, you and Cindy have been together for, for years and she's been just a great partner. And I, whenever I see you guys together, it's, it's like I'm seeing one unit. Mm-hmm. 1979. 79. Yeah. All right. Good year. We're a pair. <laughs> and Lenny? <laughs> yes. And Nancy? Well, yeah. Um, Nancy's a jeweler and a great designer and, and a great craftsman, craftswoman. And we're just lucky we have separate studios. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I've been blessed with uh, Maureen or Mo, as uh, all of you know her. She's a veterinarian. <clears throat> Loves people. And animals. And they're inextricable in her life. I mean, every, I'll look over at her. With, uh, she's being smothered with cats. I'll look over at her and I'll say... Does it matter that I'm here? <laughs> <laughs> and she won't answer. <laughs> She'll just smile. <laughs> so, gentlemen, you have been... Oh, I, I, I would also like to say that Randy and what he did in his former life <laughs> in the, in the uh, motion picture entertainment stuff, the, the study that this guy has put in to the way critters work and his ability to, to conceive like the raptosaurus in Jurassic Park. This is the guy. Uh, and, and going through that and being able to transfer all of that knowledge that he has into the work that he does is really makes them so authentic 
and we were talking about authenticity here, uh, you know, following our own star. Uh, Randy has certainly done that, and it's really obvious in the work that he does with his with his paintings, as far as I can well, say. Well, thank you. Yeah. You know, it's, it's true. I, That's very it's, humbling coming from you. Yeah. Gentlemen, you guys have been great. It's, you know, we're so used to fast cuts, quick things, explosions and stuff, but what you have just experienced is people <laughs> really thinking, people very thoughtful. You won't hear this any other place. It's because these are special people. They don't think of themselves as special because... It's what they do, but it's been a pleasure for me to just sit here and listen to their observations and their, their life force is just so strong. So thank you. Thank you. We did it. Okay. We did it. <laughs> <You know? laughs>